National Renewable Energy Laboratory estimates that there are over 10,000 closed landfills that could generate up to 63 gigawatts of electricity. It's my mission to redevelop these properties into solar revenue generating projects. You know, we all have the dump, the unattractive project, the blighted area in our town, and that's sort of the call to action is those sites make great candidates for solar energy. And if you can go and talk to your town officials, like that's the call to action. You can be an agent of change in your community by calling attention to those sites as good candidates. Your trusted source for information on the energy transition. This is the Insider's Guide to Energy podcast. Did you know you could buy power from your local landfill? And I'm not just talking about burning the gas that comes off of the trash pile. In this episode, we talk about brownfield development, putting solar projects on capped landfills, along with the challenges and growing support programs that allow you to purchase electricity. We're speaking with Annika Colston, founder and CEO of AC Power, who founded the company to do just that, put solar on brownfield sites. She has nearly two decades of experience across all aspects of project development and is a great guide for this episode. How did you discover this opportunity? I mean, th this is, you're absolutely right. I think most people when they're driving by wouldn't know a landfill if they were driving right by it. These are things that we forget about. So how did you first become aware of that as an opportunity, as something more than an eyesore, something that could actually be a source of renewable energy? Yeah, well, prior to starting AC Power in 2016, I had developed and sold a portfolio of landfill gas to energy projects. And these were small scale projects that were not required by the federal government to collect the gas. So there was an opportunity to put in a one or two engine system and and create some revenue for the site. What I found in my um, origination efforts was that most folks had old landfills that had very low or declining gas curves. And those were the uh, drains, economic drains, because they had continued operation and maintenance and regulatory compliance. And they were looking for something to do with these sites and there was no opportunity. And so after I sold the this portfolio, it came to me that solar would be an excellent uh, long-term end use for these sites. And so went back around to engage with these landfill owners and understand how could solar be a complement to their ongoing you know, O&M requirements. Just to clarify, first on landfill gas. Natural gas as a fossil fuel comes from decomposing organic matter. When we put trash in big piles in the earth, it also decomposes and releases gas, primarily methane, that would either go into the atmosphere or in this case could be burned for energy. So it's not burning the trash, but that's burning the gas that comes from decomposition. So that's your landfill gas opportunity. But that just requires essentially pipes into the landfill. Is that already in place and the gas is either going up into the air or you're burning it? Yes, most of the time it involves putting in wells and then collecting it and either flaring it, which reduces the methane and converts it, or putting it into a couple of engines to create electricity. And now they're also, you know, pipe it to create, um, you know, liquefied natural gas. And so it's Got a it. lot of opportunities. Now that doesn't do anything with the surface of the landfill. So these are big mounds, they're capped. Do they have grass on top? Like, paint the picture for us. Are they big rubber black mats with tires on top of them? What does a capped landfill look like? Have uh, been revegetated. So they have um, some low growing um, vegetation, nothing that will ideally get too tall or they do have to do mowing. And so they can often be um, steep on the side and have a plateau on the top. And so the flat areas and um, not too si slopey make great candidates for solar. 
And the way that they do it is a ballasted system. So they put concrete blocks rather than driving poles into the ground, like traditional solar, they put concrete blocks on top of the solar and just place the panels on top of them. So there's no disturbance to the landfill because as we all know, health and human safety is the priority at a landfill. Yeah. I'm a bit of a pessimist, which is probably unusual to be in renewable energy, but this is just who I am. And when things are too good to be true, I'm always skeptical. So solar, for example, folks worry about solar going into pristine vegetation, going in the soil impacts and all that. Now you're coming along with a model that I understand where the land is already disturbed. You talked about these plateaus on top. So it's basically flat. Does this make environmental impact much easier and is permitting quicker with these kind of projects? But I think that the local permitting and getting your um, site plan approvals with the community, with the planning board and the community, that part can be more straightforward. And so generally, these communities have already accepted these lands as disturbed. So they're already developed. And so you're not, com we're coming in and we're doing like solar redevelopment almost. And so the community tends to be supportive, but in terms of working with the Department of Environmental Protection or the EPA, there is a lot that goes into permitting solar on a property that's already facing environmental and regulatory compliance. All right. We, we started with some nomenclature that I just want to clear out. There, there, we're, in my mind, this interview is going to be about brownfields, and all of a sudden there's this word disturbed comes in. Help me understand what a disturbed property is and how does that play into the brownfield that we're having this conversation about? We develop solar on property that had prior contamination or had been previously disturbed, we call it. And so it may have been cleaned up and brought back to um, compliance and, and is no longer contaminated, but there is uh, no higher or better use than solar. And so often for brownfield, a traditional brownfield, a brownfield redeveloper can come in, clean up the property, and then they can put a warehouse on top of it or, you know, housing even. And so those are um, high revenue generating uh, endeavors. Putting in a, a Amazon warehouse is going to generate a lot of revenue. Solar projects are not going to generate as much revenue for the landowner. And so solar is, when solar is the best and highest use, those are the properties we're going after. And what about taxes for the community? So if I have a brownfield in my community, I don't imagine it's giving me much revenue if it's a super fun site or something like that. If you put solar on there, are there tax revenues coming into the community at that point? So many of our projects will have had like absent owners. So there is a title issue, which means that nobody is paying property taxes anymore. So we'll often have, you know, the, pro the landfill was operating in the 1970s or 80s, and then it was closed. It became a liability to the owner. The owner passed away, and now the children are not answering the phone and no one's paying taxes. So we just developed a site in Old Bridge, New Jersey, for instance, that had, you know, millions of dollars of back taxes. So this was a liability for the town. We were able to negotiate a pilot agreement, which is um, a, a lieu of taxes, an agreement in lieu of taxes, where we agreed to pay taxes moving forward, which brought revenue to, to the town. So it was just one example of how these sites can be a benefit to the community. Two questions. How big are these solar projects? And then who's the buyer of that electricity? So most of our projects have been uh, developed for community solar. And that's often because these sites are not situated near other energy loads. So we have to interconnect to the utility and then we can sell to local subscribers. And the projects tend to be either limited in size by the community solar program that we're applying into or by the interconnection or by land constraints. That's usually um, the the last constraint. These projects tend to range in about five to seven megawatts on average, 
but we've done between one megawatt and 13 and a half megawatts, all for community solar. And to put that in context for us, so a five or a 10 megawatt system is 100 households, 500 households. So the project I mentioned in New Jersey was 2.8 megawatts and it's powering 460 homes. What do you see as major trends in community solar going forward? This seems to be the, the primary use of the projects you're developing, correct? Yes, that's right. There is incredible demand for allocations from these programs. So to say it differently, these programs are extremely competitive for solar developers to win the awards. So they have a capped program that might be offering 300 megawatts per year of community solar awards. And there's often twice that amount that's being sought after by solar developers. So there is more supply of solar projects than there is demand for the community solar awards at this point. And so we hope to see more and more states implement permanent programs to support community solar. There's a federal program that's been developed, which is highly competitive as well. Um, There are some additional adders through the um, IRA that will support low and moderate income. So they're trying to um, find ways to to increase the opportunity. And I'll just add the reason why community solar is so popular is because for every site that would make an excellent candidate for solar, you have to find offtake. So who is going to purchase the electricity? And back in you know the olden days of my early career, everything was done through a power purchase agreement. And if you were lucky, you would get it through the local utility or you would find a large end user and they would enter into a 20 year plus agreement to purchase the electricity. That model is not as as active today. And so the community solar approach gives a 15 year um, subscription opportunity, which allows investors to commit the capital required to build these projects. So in order for us to build projects nationwide, we need to solve the problem with, for offtake. Now, you just mentioned nationwide. You and I got to know each other because of the mid-Atlantic region. I think it was a solar show in Maryland that we we met at for Community Solar. Um, but I also am curious as state to state. Maryland was kind of edging into Community Solar. It was up in the game this year. Some of the other mid-Atlantic states were doing something different. But your projects are in New York. I see you in Virginia. I see you all over the place. Mm-hmm. How does state to state legislation and particularly benefits for brownfields play? Because I know there's a number of states that actually have legislation that helps support these brownfield developments. How does that play into your business model? Well, it's a big factor. And so I will say that the best case scenario is if solar on landfills is not competing against solar on greenfield projects. Because as I mentioned, they are just different in terms of the timeline to develop them and the amount of risk and capital that goes uh, goes into the project up front. And so from my perspective, you know, we're working with large corporates. Uh, We work on Superfund sites, which have a group of potentially responsible parties. So you might be working with 30 corporates that are ultimately responsible for the financial remedy, the, the environmental remedy at a site. And so when we work with them and they're on board and say, yes, we want to develop a solar on this site with you, we want some predictability for the next you know, two or three years that we're going to be able to work with the EPA or the local DEP and the, and the municipal government to get this project approved, we're going to be able to go through the interconnection process, which can take years sometimes, and we'll be able to get an interconnection agreement. And at the end, we will have an incentive and um, a program that the project can land at the end. And so that is um, extremely tricky when you're just competing against everyone else that have you know, rooftop warehouse project doesn't take years to permit. It's much easier. Now, when I look through the DOE or NREL's um, projections of doing this kind of brownfield development for solar, um, they always talk about the levelized cost of electricity. So what is the cost of electricity and the impact to these kind of projects? Well, again, that's an attractive part about community solar and why we're all, you know, 
put, pushing for more community solar. The revenue source for community solar is the residential rate. And so we're often offering a discount to the residential rate, but the residential rate is much higher than the commercial rate that would otherwise be available, or even worse, the wholesale rate. And so you might be getting 14 cents per kilowatt hour at the residential rate. And on the wholesale rate, if you were just selling into the PJM market, for instance, it might be three and a half cents. And that differential is obviously a deal killer for many of these projects. So instead of selling on the wholesale rate, again, screen fill power projects, you're able to uh, in some maybe 5x the amount of revenue through the community solar programs. That makes a ton of sense. And these are all traditional technologies. This is normal flat plate silicon PV. Are there other innovations that are helping you develop these projects? It's some exciting. I mean, the solar market is always innovating. And so um, most of the market is working with trackers now. So the solar panels move with the sun throughout the day, and that has an impact on the production efficiency. So you can produce a lot more kilowatt hours per day with a solar panel that moves with the sun. And as I mentioned, we have ballasted systems. So our projects sit on top of the concrete and the panel that is generally fixed. And so our production efficiency is much lower. But there are now uh, technology providers that are looking to do uh, trackers on ballasted systems. And if we can do that, we're seeing sometimes you know 50% more output. And there are you know trade-offs with everything you will you will take, it will take greater land area to do a tracker system. So you might have some losses in your DC capacity, but you have significant gains in the production. Another thing that would be exciting is, as I mentioned, we can really only build on the flat surfaces or something that's kind of less than a 15% slope. Many landfills have significant side slopes. They are designed to try to maximize the airspace that they've been permitted. So there are many opportunities where there are side slopes and there might be solar um, south facing side slopes. So if we can develop technology that will allow us to uh, put the panels in a not way that's not disturbing the landfill on these slopes, we would again increase the acreage that could be developed significantly. That's really exciting. Uh, you mentioned also going back to the financing side and regulatory side, that there are increasingly uh, additional adders out of the recent IRA bill. How is that improving the financeability of your projects? Well, I'll just say that it's very exciting that the Inflation Reduction Act was passed, but like most things, solar, it is ups and downs. I and mean, that's why we call it the solar coaster, right? So I remember in you know August of 2022, when it was passed, we were all thrilled that there was the energy communities adder and there were brownfield adder included into that. But then as we read more and more of the details, we realized there were many, many exclusions. And so a lot of um, our projects actually don't qualify under the Brownfield Adder. But overall, now that we're, you know, a year and a half in, we are finding ways to identify projects that will qualify for a 40, sometimes a 50% adder. And with those kind of um, tax credits, you can develop solar almost nationwide and you won't have to rely on a state's program or a state's SREC. And I think that could be really exciting. But the what we've found is there's a bit of an early mover disadvantage. You know, tax equity providers are a bit conservative. They're risk averse. It's many, um, you know, bankers and lawyers who don't want to take a lot of risk on the IRS issuing new guidance that contradicts something that they underwrote, and then they may not be um, a, if that tax equity may not be available. So we've been working with insurance providers on tax equity insurance, which was something that was totally new to me, but was, again, how the market started when the ITC was first realized many years ago. And so until there's more experience with it, the insurance seems to be a good product. 
I'm just going to say, I did not put you up to that at all. That was complete uh, on, on your own accord, bringing up financing and insurance, which are, of course, my, my favorite topics here. Going back, I just want to clarify, you said a lot of these projects don't qualify under the Brownfield Adder, which when you get it, takes a 30% investment tax credit and can bump it up to 40 or 50% of the project's value. That's really impressive. But it seems like you're doing exactly the types of projects that should fit. Where is that uh, legislation missing the target? What the Congress essentially did when they were writing the bill is they took the EPA's definition of brownfield, which basically says any property that has a some contamination or you know has has um, identified something through a phase one or a phase two study is a brownfield. So it basically like throws everything in and, and qualifies. And then it starts with the exclusions. So it says, except if, and it's in those exclusions that it basically eliminates so many of these um, opportunities. And the rationale, as I understood it, was that when, so they relied on the CERCLA definition, which is um, a, uh, a, a definition that's used by the EPA. And it is designed so that for responsible for the waste that was put in was not able to benefit from any money that was available to the government. So they didn't want to pay the polluters, essentially. So this was the problem with using the definition is the polluters are actually not the ones that are developing the solar projects. We're developing the solar projects and the solar project needs the ITC revenue in order for it to be economic. So it was apparently one of those like late night oversights where they didn't realize using that definition would actually be a disaster. All right. I think what we should do is I think we, I think we should switch gears, go into your personal journey a bit, a bit about you. And we started out very high level there, but let's, let's, let's dive in a little bit. How did you end up doing this? So you started working with gas in Brownfields. How, how, how did this transition take place? Yeah. So I've always been in renewable energy project development, but I've always been drawn to the niche project, you know, the project that needs a little something to get going. And, you know, I guess I like a challenge and, um, found that I could be u most useful when I was quarterbacking these difficult projects. So as I'd mentioned with these small scale landfill gas to energy projects, they weren't the low hanging fruit. The tr traditional landfill gas developer wasn't interested in them. When I sold that portfolio, many of my friend colleagues were in the solar market. And I was like, yeah, 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 solar, it's so easy, which now I know it's not for anybody. <laughs> I was like, such a mature market. What would I do in solar? Where would my expertise be useful? And that's where I realized in these landfill projects. And I think that I can communicate well with landfill owners who really don't feel incentivized to put solar on their landfill because they are trying to stay in compliance. They don't want anything to happen to their landfill site. And so we can make them feel comfortable that land that solar will be a great complement to their landfill and health and human safety is always the priority. And it's just so rewarding to see these projects go forward and realize all of the benefits that can come along with them, like we mentioned previously. Now, amazing that you say that you you interact very well with these these owners of the land and move them forward. Um, does it ever come up that you're a female owned business in in is this a space? I don't think landfills and female owned businesses. That's just not the first thing that pops to mind when I'm thinking reclaiming landfills. Yes, um, I am a bit unusual in the market for sure, and there are. Um, there are a lot of folks that are really excited to work with a woman-owned business and that we do have a lot of women that work here and that are in the environmental um, and redevelopment space. So yeah, it's um, it's been a great journey being able to um, continue to support women in technology, women in the environment, women in redevelopment. And what advice do you have for other aspiring leaders of, of any sort, whether they're, you know, uh, 
women who want to found their own company or other people of diverse background or just listeners in general who are looking to get more into this sector and might have not realized that there are really hard parts even in mature industries? I, I think for me, it, it, it was about finding things that I was really passionate about and not because they made me feel good or happy, but usually because they made me feel really frustrated and like I wanted to do something about it. And so I think that was was what drove me to start AC Power and continue to be an advocate in this space and you know continue to work through all of the challenges because we ultimately all want to see these projects and these sites redeveloped. I, we need to go back to that for a second because that's so fascinating. I feel like the conventional wisdom is find something you love. What you just said is different from that. You said, find something that's frustrating. Tell me more about what you mean by that and why that is so counter to the conventional advice. Well, I think that if it's something that's frustrating, it's usually because it's going to be difficult and there is, you know, an obstacle, a barrier. And so that to me presents opportunity. And so the problems we, um, you know, we're a very mission driven company. We have, um, our values and under our values are a series of grounders. And so every week we talk about our, um, what's the grounder for the week. And we try to use them in our language. And one of them that we use all the time is we don't have problems. We have opportunities. So if you identify these problems, these frustrations, there's usually a, um, something that needs to be fixed, tweaked, repaired, and that takes innovation and change. And so that's what we seek to do. Wow. That, that's, that's amazing. What, what I'd like to do is ask one thing that I ask all our guests, and it's a crystal ball question. And so I'm just curious, how much power do you see being generated from brownfields in about a year from now? Well, I mean, I really want to say 1.21 gigawatts because <laughs> it's back to the future. Like, what other answer? <laughs> I Wonderful. mean, if I, if I had my crystal ball, that's what I would say. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you so much for being on the podcast today. It's been a pleasure having you as our guest. Thank you so much. The pleasure is mine.